All right, everybody, we're now to chapter 14. So we've done chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, but now we're jumping kind of to the end of the book with chapter 14. Uh, it's just how we're following along with the way that the college has ordered it. Um, this is the muscular skeletal system. It's really more of the skeletal system. Um, if you've had anatomy before, then you're going to be in excellent shape. If not, then if you do take anatomy after this, you'll be in pretty good shape. Uh, one thing I'll note, because we are skipping from the beginning of the book, kind of the end of the book, there are going to be a couple terms that are um, introduced in those intermediate chapters that we haven't actually done. So some of them won't explicitly be in a table for you because they're in those intermediate chapters. They're just going to expect that you know it. So I did want to point out in the book, towards the end here, um, if you're ever unsure about what a word means, uh, there is an appendix in your book. Uh, it is Appendix C, and that appendix starts on, let me flip to the right page, um, page 722 in your textbook. So it looks something like this, um, where it has all of the different combining forms prefixes and suffixes, they're in alphabetical order, um, it tells you what they mean and then what chapter you're actually initially taught those words. So I thought that that was really helpful um, and you might not know that it exists in the back of your book. Um, and then at the end of that you'll see how it has um, all the prefixes, all of the suffixes, it's hard to see in the video, um, for these words as well. So that way when you get to one that you don't know or tell yourself I've never seen before, it's possible. You will still be required to know what they are. So go to that um, back of the book resource to help you. All right, I'm going to pop out of the video and we're going to go ahead and get started on learning all of these terms. First, we're going to figure out, you know, what structures are exactly involved in the muscular skeletal system, uh, key pieces, and then put the words to those pieces. Um, general functions, if you're asking yourself, you know, what does the muscular system, what does the skeletal system do, we're kind of lumping them together because they do go hand in hand. Um, they consist of your muscles and your bones, but also all of the bone marrow and the joints and the cartilage, tendons, ligaments, and so on. Um, if you didn't know, you have 206 bones as an adult. Um, even more than that when you're a child because uh, your uh, cranial bones fuse together and you have over 600 muscles in your body and I hope you know this that joints are where two or more bones come together like your knee joint or your elbow joint uh, and within that there's cartilage and bursa and other things. What does it do? Well if you think about the muscular system it helps you move. Um, it helps you keep your posture and your joints stable. It also generates heat when it moves, so it helps keep you warm. Uh, your skeletal system gives you a framework so you're not, you know, a blob on the floor. Uh, it protects all of your soft internal organs. Uh, same with the muscular system there. Um, the skeletal bones also store calcium and protect your bone marrow, where you actually make your red blood cells or all blood cells, I should say. Um, <clears throat> if we're thinking back to chapter 3 and our anatomical planes, uh, the front is anterior. I suppose you could say ventral, but we would say anterior. And the back is posterior, or dorsal. Here's the breakdown of what a bone is. Um, the internal structure. I'm not going to make you memorize all of the different layers of this. I just wanted to to give you a little bit of background. There's going to be one or two words that kind of go with this. The uh, periosteum is that outermost layer of fibrous tissue. As you can see in the picture, you can kind of peel it back. The compact bone lies right under that. That's that dense hard layer of bone tissue. Within that you get that spongy bone the cancellous bone um, on the inside, and then endosteum 
is the membrous internal lining. So you can see endo means internal, and that's the internal lining of that hollow cavity, the medullary cavity. Um, in terms of the shaft of the bone, there's diaphysis and epiphysis, um, whether it's the shaft or the ends of the bone. On the inside, you have bone marrow. Uh, the red bone marrow is where the blood cells are formed. The yellow marrow is um, more of a soft, fatty material that you can find in that area. Um, just to give you a background, I'm going to jump through what some different skeletal bones are. Um, you might know them from other classes, you might not, but I just wanted to, to give you a quick gist before we jump into uh, what the different bones are in terms of medical words. So, oops, I jumped ahead. Let's see if I can go back. Okay, there we go. So, if you're looking at this picture, we have the upper jaw, which is where your top set of teeth are aligned. That's called the maxilla. And then the lower jaw bone includes the kind of wrap around of, oops, hopping all over, sorry, um, wrap around of your chin and has all your um, lower teeth involved. So maxilla on top, mandible on bottom. Uh, your vertebral column is made up of individual vertebrae. Vertebra is uh, singular, vertebrae is plural, um, and then inside of that is where your spinal cord would run. Um, there are different sections of your vertebral column. Uh, so here we have, at top, we have the cervical. So this is kind of those neck bones. You have seven of them. Interesting fact I learned this summer is that giraffes also have seven neck bones, but obviously their neck is a little bit longer. Um, then we have the thoracic section, which has a series of 12 vertebrae. Um, this is where you would have your rib cage, so all those points of attachment of the ribs where your heart and lungs and everything are protected, and it's got its own little curvature. Um, then we go to the lumbar section, which is where your lower back is located. Um, you can see that there are five of those. And then, after those different sections, we have a series of fused vertebrae. We have the sacrum and the coccyx. The coccyx is the fancy word for your little tailbone. And you can see from the side view, it does have a little curvature. Um, this is just what I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, there are abbreviations, as you will see in the textbook for each one of these um, sections. There's the cervical vertebrae. It's not abbreviated CV. It's C1 through C7 to denote which specific one you might be talking about. Um, thoracic is T1 through T12. Lumbar is L1 through L5. And then sacrum and coccyx. They don't have abbreviations, but the sacrum is a, a series of five vertebrae fused together, and then the coccyx is really four of them fused together. Okay, I'm jumping back in a little bit here so that I can kind of show you where the different bones are. Um, clavicles, you have two of them. Um, they are your collarbones, so they're located, you know, on either side right here. Some people you can see them, some people you can't. Um, your scapula is your shoulder blade, so you have one on either side. Um, your sternum is your breastbone, so that is going to be like that intermediate one that runs down the middle um, where your ribs attach. In your upper extremities, you have your humerus, which is going to be that upper arm bone. You have one on either side of your body. Um, you have your radius and ulna which are your lower arm bones. Um, we'll see them in more depth soon. Um, but you have your radius. The ulna is the one that connects to the elbow, so that's kind of how I always remember it. Um, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So your carpal is your wrist bones. You actually have 16 of them. Um, your metacarpals are really your hand bones, so you have 10 of them. And then phalanges, you actually have... 28 of them. If you think about all the bones that kind of go into making a finger, there's multiple bones there. It's not just one. Um, pelvic bones, you can see in the picture here, um, 
You have an ilium, which are really what we think of when you put your hands on your hips, these hip bones on either side. Um, the ischium, which are the parts that kind of wrap around these little curvy parts at the end. This is the socket where your um, femur would attach, those leg bones. And then you have the pubis, one on either side that kind of joins together here um, to complete the pelvic bones. They're all fused together, um, but there is cartilage right here in the middle where the pubis attaches because some ladies have to have babies and that spot's got to get a little bigger. Um, in terms of lower extremities, um, your femur is your upper leg bone. I don't know if I can show you that easily via video, um, but your upper leg bone, you have uh, one on either side. It's the tallest bone and biggest bone in your body. Um, your patella is the fancy word for your kneecap. So you have one on each leg of those. Um, tibia and fibula are the two lower leg bones. So the tibia is the front one that we call our shin bone, and then the fibula is the little tiny one in the back that helps with balance. Just like your hands, we had carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. On your toes and feet, you have tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Your fingers and toes are both called phalanges. Um, and similarly to your hands, your toes, if you were to bend them, you'd notice that there are more um, than one bone per toe. Um, your tarsals are your ankle bones and your metatarsals are your foot bones. Okay, I'm going to hop back out of video now because I don't think I need to be in there. This brings us to our knee joint. Um, so this is a good picture to have and to know. It kind of breaks down what that looks like for you. Um, you can see in this case it's the uh, femur on the top, so that large, large bone, and then on the bottom you can see the tibia, which is that bigger shin bone in front, and then the fibula is this thin guy back here. Um, bone is connected to bone via ligament, so you can see that here and here on either side. And then within that knee joint, from the side, or the front you can't really tell, but from the side you can see the patella here is kind of situated um, with some cartilage and tendon surrounding. Um, tendons are muscle to bone, um, ligament bone to bone, however you need to remember it. Um, but you can see within the, the knee joint, you can see there's layers of cartilage there. There's also a meniscus in there, which is a piece of cartilage like the knee, um, oftentimes injured or ruptured in sports injuries. Um, you have a synovial cavity. Um, where there's synovial fluid that's secreted to kind of help keep everything lubricated. Um, you have bursa, which can also um, rupture or get injured. These are fluid-filled sacs that also help allow for um, movement within those joints. So we're going to get a couple medical terms that relate to different parts of joints. Um, I'm not going to ask you to specifically label a joint, but it gives you an idea of what you're working with. Um, all of these definitions are in your book. Um, I just kind of went through most of them right now. Um, the cartilage, in this case, is called articular cartilage. Again, it's covering those rough surfaces. Um, what's not shown in the knee joint but are in other joints, you have intervertebral discs. What you don't always think of the vertebrae is really being joints, but the, in between each one of those vertebrae, so you don't have bone rubbing on bone, you have those intervertebral discs, which again, you can get all kinds of herniated discs, ruptured discs um, with different types of back injuries. And then, as I mentioned when I showed you the pelvis, we have what's called the pubic symphysis, which is where the two pelvic... Um, pubic bones meet, there's a little piece of cartilage that comes together to keep, you know, bone rubbing from bone. Um, and then these are the terms that I, I covered a little bit before, synovial fluid, bursa, ligament tendon, the difference. The only thing I didn't really cover is an aponeurosis, which is a very strong piece of connective tissue um, that's acting as a tendon.
Just to recap our different muscles, um, because muscles are a part of this chapter as well, um, we're going to focus on three, skeletal muscle being one of them. You can see the striations, it's, that's why it's also called striated muscle. Um, this is what attaches, uh, or this is what is attached to bones by tendons, and it helps in body movements. So it helps produce action by, you know, contracting and relaxing and, and then moving the skeletal system as a result. These are also called voluntary because you're having conscious control over those muscles. Um, the smooth muscles, you can see they don't have those stripes or striations. These are called involuntary because they line your internal organs and blood vessels and tract. Um, and then you kind of involuntarily respond with um, actions like peristalsis in your stomach. The third type is cardiac muscle, and this one is found inside your heart, which is why it's called cardiac. It's another involuntary one, but that's the one that contracts to give you the heartbeat that you have. All right, so now we're going to actually get to the word parts that go with the muscular skeletal system. This looks like a lot of words. Um, with that, again, if you're familiar with the names of the bones, this is actually going to be very easy. If you're not, I apologize. It's a bit of an uphill battle. Um, but all of the combining forms that go with the bones are pretty much a shortened version of what the actual name of the bone is. So, for example, carpo is for your carpals. Those are your wrist bones. Clavico and claviculo both are your clavicle. Um, not all of them are super easy. For example, costo means rib. Um, it's not ribo, <laughs> unfortunately, because um, it had to do more with the costal cartilage that's involved. Um, cranio means your cranium or your skull. So it depends in your head. Um, cephalo kind of means head, but that's more directed toward the brain. Cranio is the head in terms of the skull. Uh, femoro is one I want to draw your attention to because femur is spelt with a U, but when you're turning it into this medical term, they take the U and they turn it into the, an O. So fem femur is femoro with an O. Um, fibulo for fibula, humoro for humerus, and so on. Um, I'm trying to look... The one that gets a little bit tricky is here where you have rachio, spondylo, and, oop, there's a typo. This should say vertebro here, or vertebro. And all of those mean vertebrae or spine or your vertebral column. So they're going to be used interchangeably a little bit throughout the chapter. I just wanted to draw your attention to those. Um, let's see. All the rest are very, very straightforward with the name of the bone. So if you want to take a break right now to really work on exercises two and three, those are going to be very helpful diagrams. I think they're the same as what I have shared in the diagram sheet to study from to help you so that you can understand where they come from. So please pause the PowerPoint, take some time to fill that out before continuing. There are a few combining forms that are associated with the joint. Um, so we have aponeuro, which is really for that aponeurosis part, which is that thick um, connective tissue piece. We have arthro. Um, as we learned in chapter one, that's going to be our generic word for joint. Uh, Burso for bursa, or the cavity itself. Um, Chondro is a generic term for cartilage, um, which is why we had, you know, when we're talking about our regions, there was the hypochondriac region for under the cartilage. Uh, disco, with a K, has to do with your intervertebral discs. Um, whereas, you know, in the previous slide, we had uh, vertebro, spondylo, and rachio, those all were specific to the vertebrae. 
Disco has to do with the intervertebral discs. Um, menisco has to do with that meniscus. Synovia, synovio has to do with the synovia or that synovial fluid. Um, and then lastly, for tendon, there's three different choices. You have teno, tendo, and tendino. Um, note the spelling on tendino. It's not the same as tendon. Um, but exercise eight there has another diagram that might be helpful for you to label and then use to study. Before we get to prefixes and suffixes, there's one last list of combining forms. Um, this doesn't have to do with the structural anatomy. It's more of uh, accompanying words. So we have ankylo. No, that is not your ankle. Um, ankylo has to do with stiff or bent. Um, so if something like your ankle joint is very stiff and won't bend, that could be something. Kinesio is movement or motion. That's why people who study kinesiology are studying movement. Um, kypho is a hump. So if you are kind of hunched over and you have a real big hump um, on the spine, that's kypho. Lamino has to do with the lamina, which is a very thin or flat plate or layer, and I'll show that to you a little bit later. Uh, lordo is bent forward. Um, so in your book, it kind of, I just want to clarify kypho versus lordo. So if you are hunched over and have a hump, that's kypho. If you're bent forward a little and the concavity of your spine increases, um, that's lordo. Myo and myoso both mean muscle. We've seen myo before. Uh, myello with an E-L in there is bone marrow. Um, we'll see that again in chapter 15, but myelo means bone marrow in this instance. Osteo means bone, like osteoporosis uh, is one easily thought of. Petro means stone. Uh, we also learned, uh, or will learn, another term for stone, but for right now, petro. If something becomes petrified, that means it turns to stone. Sacro, or, excuse me, sarco means flesh or connective tissue. We learned that one already. And scolio means a curved spine. So this is really, when you're using scolio, that means that the spine, if you're kind of looking at someone's back, is either curved to the left or to the right. It doesn't have to do with kind of sticking out or sticking in. But take some time to work through the exercises before you continue to move forward. Prefixes and suffixes, there's not a whole bunch. Um, but just know that when we get to some of the words, there might be a few uh, sprinkled in that we haven't learned before. Um, inter means between. So we had intra before, that means within. Inter means between two different things. Supra, like epi, means above or upon. Sim and sin both mean together or joined. In terms of suffixes, asthenia means a weakness. So if you have a muscle weakness for like myasthenia, then that would be a muscle weakness, uh, meaning that it's not working as properly as it should. Um, desis means that you're fusing or surgically fixating. If you think about people who might get um, vertebral uh, bones fused together. Um, physis means growth. If you think back to the picture of the long bone, you had the diaphysis, epiphysis um, for the long and the end parts of the bone. Schisis, um, it's hard to say. Schisis is this one right here. That means a split or a fissure. So maybe you need to break something on purpose or um, we'll see that a little bit later on. And then trophy means nourishment or development. So we saw that one before when we were learning some words. 
that it means over or under developed if you say hypertrophy, hypotrophy, that kind of thing. Okay, so in the medical term, symphysis, what does the prefix mean? If you know that the sim is the prefix, then you should be able to tell yourself that it means joined or together. Uh, so that's why A is the best answer. Uh, collectively, this would mean to grow together as a word. Which brings us to the diseases and disorders. Um, there's tons that are from word parts, uh, and then we'll get into others after that. Again, every time you see one of these lists, don't necessarily freak out. Um, if you see that it's from word parts, then everything up to this point you should be okay with because um, you just need to piece it together. And I'm looking through and I don't see any, oh, there's one suffix in here that you haven't seen before, um, and that is algia in the term fibromyalgia. I'm sure all of you have seen a commercial about medication for fibromyalgia. Um, the suffix algia, I don't, let me consult my book here. Um, algia is introduced in chapter 5, so we didn't see it previously. Um, it means pain. So this would be pain in the fibrous muscle is what fibromyalgia means. Um, other terms in here, ankylosis, this would be an abnormal condition of stiffness. Um, lots of inflammations. We have inflammation of the joint, inflammation of the bursa, inflammation of the disc, um, inflammation of the maxilla, that upper jaw bone. Uh, let's see. You can have softening of the cartilage, chondromalacia. You can have um, craniosis. That's a, a weird one, but it means like a split in the cranium. So this might be something that happens at birth. It's like a congenital defect. Um, kyphosis is an abnormal condition of a hump. So that would be a humpback, for example. Whereas lordosis would be an abnormal con uh, condition of bending forward. Um, and that has to do with your lumbar spine. So your um, lower back is kind of sticking forward. Um, it's the kind of opposite issue of a hunchback. You're kind of hunching over, so the top part of your spine is kind of sticking out towards the back, whereas lordosis is you're kind of sticking your, your stomach forward because your lower back is inching forward. Um, then there's meniscitis. Uh, myasthenia is one I had mentioned before. Um, Again, the O in myo is dropped because asthenia starts with an A, but that would be muscle weakness. Um, myeloma would be a tumor because it has oma in that case of the bone marrow. Um, osteoarthritis has an abbreviation OA, something to remember. Um, here's the crazy rest of the uh, word list. Um, you'll notice that there's lots and lots and lots of osteos because they all has to do with bone. Um, whether it's um, inflammation of the bone and cartilage, whether it's a tumor, whether it's softening. Um, here's another one that we haven't seen before in terms of a suffix, penia. Penia has to do with a reduction in number or a reduced amount. So in this case, it would be a reduction in the amount of bone. Um, so that's something that could lead to the next term, or osteoporosis, which I don't think is on this list. Um, there's osteopetrosis. My uh, mouse went crazy there for a second. There's osteopetrosis, so that would be the abnormal condition of bone turning to stone. Um, Rachyshysis. So this is a silly word to say anyway, but that means that there's a split or fissure in the spinal column. And if you've ever seen pictures of spina bifida, it has to do with the um, spinal cord kind of protruding out through the vertebral column. So that's why it's also called spina bifida. Um, let's see. Other terms. 
You should be able to kind of figure out by looking through what your pieces mean. Um, I would suggest working through exercise 18 or 19. 19 I always find is a little bit easier. 18 is the harder version uh, of using these words in context, breaking them down into their parts, because uh, that's something that you will see on the test. And then we're going to move to the ones that are not built from word parts. Uh, just as a reference, this is what a normal happy knee joint looks like. Um, we went through the diagram before, but now you can kind of see what a real x-ray version looks like. And then this is what it would look like if you have osteoarthritis. If you come up back to the original, you can see there's a nice separation here where the cartilage would be. And then if you have osteoporosis, you can see what that looks like. Um, or excuse me, osteoarthritis. Um, and it's inflammation of the bone in the joint, but you can see it can be quite painful because the bone ends up being rigid or um, sharp, and then you have bone rubbing on bone because that cartilage layer there or buffer is not present. Um, we also have an example of rheumatoid arthritis, which we will get at a little point in time later. Um, but you get inflammation, um, part of the bone starts to wash, uh, waste away so it's not as robust as it was before. Um, the synovial membranes and things like that can still be there, but there's a lot of inflammation. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is associated with a lot of inflammation, so you can see it's even kind of shifted over a little bit. All right, which one of these means the softening of bones? If you can remember what softening means, you will be in good shape. C has the correct answer, osteomalacia. All right, another review question. The medical term that means an abnormal loss of density that may increase your fractures. This would be osteoporosis. So you can see kind of the density of... Um, the bone here versus, and then zoomed in what that looks like and then you can see what the osteoporosis version looks like there's, there's much more gaps between all right this brings us to the not so fun list of not from word parts diseases um, the first one is called ankylosing spondylitis i think that was in the very very intro video from buzzfeed of people trying to say words um, but this is a form of arthritis um, that affects the spine, which is why the spondylo is in there. Um, but it bake an ankylo for bent. So it causes stiffness and eventually bending based on having arthritis in the um, spinal column. Next is a bunion, a very common thing, um, mostly caused by women wearing poor footwear. Uh, but it can be hereditary. But it's where that's pictured here as well. There's a protrusion of the joint, so where the toe and the, I guess, the phalange and the metatarsal meet here, it kind of sticks out. Um, it's a very common problem, but that can eventually be fixed, but it, it happens. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, or CTS, has to do with your carpals or your wrists. Um, there's a little nerve that runs in between some of these wrist carpals here. And when that gets compressed, it can cause problems, which is, and in, that happens when we, you know, type a lot. Uh, and so that nerve is called the median nerve, uh, but that's what that is. A Collie's fracture is a type of wrist, wrist fracture, um, which is really what this picture is showing here. It's when you go to fall and you stop yourself uh, and you end up breaking your uh, lower arm bones here, whether it's your radius or your ulna. Um, think of people falling off of their skateboards or whatever else they're falling off of. Um, exostosis is the fancy word for a bone spur, and that's what's pictured here. 
you can see on the heel, it's just a little extra growth of bone coming off where it normally would. And sometimes it can be painful if it's sharp. Um, they would go in and surgically kind of file that away. But it's exostosis. Fracture. There are different types and kinds of fractures. Collie's fracture up here was one example of that. Um, it's abbreviated FX. Gout is a disease where you have too much uric acid building up, um, whether it's from diet or um, other circumstances. Uh, you get this buildup of uric acid crystals, and it deposits itself in your joints, and then you can get arthritis as a result. Um, it oftentimes happens in your big toe, because that's where it likes to deposit itself, but it can be in other areas as well. Um, herniated disc is the same thing as a slip disc, a ruptured disc, um, and so on. It basically means that something has happened to that intervertebral disc. Um, it either that generally it kind of sticks itself out and can press on the spinal cord and cause a lot of pain that way. Um, oh, here's an example of a clear picture of what that carpal tunnel looked like. You can see the median nerve kind of running through, um, and then you can see the um, flexors coming over there. So then when you type a lot, you have a tendency to compress that median nerve and give, it, give yourself a carpal tunnel tunnel problem. Okay, so excessive uric acid might cause what? This also does look like this person has a little bit of a bunion, but that's not what it's asking. Um, gout is the uric acid problem. Um, here are the rest of the list of words. Lyme disease is the first. Um, it's an infection that you can get um, typically from deer ticks, but it's a bacterial infection that can give you all kinds of symptoms related to the muscular skeletal system, and that's why they put it in this chapter. Um, muscular dystrophy is MD. Uh, it's a hereditary condition, and that's where your muscles begin to degenerate. Next, we have myasthenia gravis, MG. Um, this is a chronic problem of muscle weakness. Um, so the key problem here is that it's a communication problem. Um, your nerves are firing just fine, but that message is not getting translated to the muscle cells. Um, and eventually, if that can't happen, then the muscles aren't going to work no matter what your nerves are saying. So, it's not that they've degenerated, there's a communication problem, something is happening in the transmission process. Uh, osteoporosis, I talked a bit about before and had a picture of. It's where your bone density gets decreased, um, and then that can increase your chances of getting fractures. So it's kind of a problem with elderly, um, needing to make sure you get enough calcium, because that helps keep your bones strong. Plantar fasciitis is a uh, an inflammation of the plantar fascia. It's a tissue um, that's in the sole of your foot. So a lot of people who are um, athletes uh, do repetitive type motions and then that can cause a lot of heel pain. Rheumatoid arthritis I showed you a picture of in the joint. Um, it's kind of an autoimmune inflammation disorder. It's chronic so it comes and goes throughout time. Spinal stenosis. Uh, stenosis as a term means narrowing. So in this case, we're doing spinal stenosis. So it's narrowing the spinal canal, which as you can imagine, if that hole gets smaller, then it's going to start to put pressure on the spinal cord and the nerve roots and so on. Um, and then we have spondylolithiasis. And what that means is that... Um, the vertebral um, bones slip over one another. And there might be a picture in your book of it, I think. Um, but one kind of slips past the other, and as you can imagine, can push on the spinal cord and cause lots of problems. All right, so which word has to do with getting a bite from a deer tick? 
that can then have a whole bunch of muscular skeletal consequences. Hopefully you're thinking of Lyme disease. FYI, pets can get Lyme disease too. Um, abnormal curvature of the spine. So this does not have to do with um, a hump or being bent forward or back. This has to do with a, a lateral bend, right or left. This is an example of scoliosis. Um, here we have spondylolisthesis, which is that slipping of one disc over the other disc. You can kind of see it here um, where this L4 is kind of protruding out farther than the L5, and it can push on the spinal cord as a result. Over here we have spinal stenosis. Um, you can see that this little area here has gotten a little bit overgrown, so the hole that once used to be for the spinal cord actually has been narrowed and can cause a lot of pain. Take some time to work through. There's more pictures in your book on page 555 um, and so on to kind of get an idea of what that might look like in those terms mean. Uh, here's a table where I just kind of compiled what the medical term is, but what we also might call them in our everyday lives. Um, like a kyphosis, we would say they have a humpback. Or um, if they have rachishisis, we would say that they have spina bifida. Or a bone spur instead of exostosis. So on. Okay. Well, we've made it through the diseases and disorders. So now we are going to get to the surgical terms. And there are a lot of them, but I do want to say that there's not a whole bunch that you need to worry because they are all built from parts. However, a lot of those parts we haven't seen before because they've been introduced in other chapters. So I kind of highlighted them here and I just want to, to go through them with you so that you know what they mean. Uh, Raffi. If we remember back when Rhea had that RRH for discharge, Raffi is suturing. So RRH, A-P-H-Y, make sure to practice the spelling, means suturing of the aponeurosis, that connective tissue layer. Um, so anytime you see this, then that means you're suturing or stitching up whatever it is. It's a surgical procedure. Um, centesis means that you are surgically puncturing to aspirate fluid. Um, what that means is you make a hole to get all the fluid out. Usually it's a needle, you stick it in wherever it is and then suck out whatever fluid is in the cavity. In this case it would be a joint. So if anyone's had a sports injury where then they have to have their knee drained, that's what this is, arthrocentesis. Um, desis is another word for fusion. So an arthrodesis might be fusing um, parts of the joint. Plasty, we've kind of learned before, this is surgical procedure or surgical repair of the joint. Um, next we get to bursectomy. So in this case, again, the A from uh, or O from verse O gets removed for ectomy, and um, they're going to actually go in and remove the bursa, whether it's too damaged or whatever else may be involved. Um, there's other things that you can remove, whether it's a carpal or uh, some cartilage and so on, um, lamina, maxilla, uh, meniscus, disc, all of those are ectomies. Um, tomy, or with the O there, it's otomy. That would be a surgical incision, if we remember. Uh, tomy means incision. Ectomy means removal. So a craniotomy would be an incision into the cranium or the skull. Otherwise, you should pretty much know what these mean by putting parts together. Um, here's the rest of that list. Um, you can see again we have raffi or suturing, so this would be a suturing of the muscle. Um, we have more incisions and removals. Um, 
depending on which bone you're, you're talking about, um, and so on. So I'm not going to go through each one of these individually, but I do want you to take some time to pause the PowerPoint, um, work on exercise 26 or 27 um, in your book. The page number is there uh, to get some practice with these before we go to uh, the next set. And luckily, there are no surgical terms that are not built from word parts. Here's an example of what a discectomy might look like. Um, it's kind of hard to tell from the picture, but there's a disc issue back here. Um, you can see that the nerves are kind of pushed off to the side, so they need to kind of remove some tissue. So they kind of go in and literally kind of, or there's an overgrowth here. Um, they have an incision tube, and within that, they kind of have tiny knives and, and grabbers that they then pull that um, harmful part out that might be pushing on nerves or the spinal cord. So um, as you can see in here, this would be the piece of the vertebra, this is your spinal cord, and then this would be that intervertebral disc that's pushing and causing pain. Um, which surgery is performed to remove pressure um, from the herniated disc? Hopefully we can get this one. laminectomy. So the lamina could be part of here and it's pushing and basically they just need to remove the, the herniated portion that's pushing on there so they could go in and remove it. The correct spelling, again spelling is always important, of the term that means surgical puncture to aspirate fluid from the joint. So, hopefully, they all look very, very, very similar, but C is the correct answer. Arthro is where different ones up here are spelled wrong. So, arthrocentesis is the correct answer. Okay, this brings us to the diagnostic terms. So, diagnostic terms are the ones that... Um, are oftentimes with different types of scans, for example. So... There's diagnostic imaging, there could be endoscopy. Um, in our case, we have arthrography, which is a term. Um, it's not used super often, but uh, graphy is a suffix. This is really the first time I think we're introduced to it. Graphy, we're gonna see a ton of times. There's graphy and graph. Graphy is the actual process of doing the image or taking the radiographic image. This is an x-ray. Uh, a radiographic image, in this case, of the joint. Oftentimes now we use um, an MRI uh, to get a better sense of what's going on in different joints. Arthroscopy would be an arthroscopic procedure. Maybe there's something wrong with your knee and they don't really know, so they need to kind of go in and look around. That would be that. Electromyogram, or an EMG, a gram is a recording. So in this case, they're recording the electrical um, activity in your skeletal muscles, seeing maybe if they're, they're firing correctly or not. All right, which one of these pictures would it represent the word? Um, this person is doing a visual examination of the joint. So you would definitely say B, arthroscopy. You can say scopy, that's fine too. This brings us to the complementary terms. We're getting towards the end of the chapter. Yay. Um, there's a lot that are built from word parts, but it's pretty simple in my opinion. And then we'll get to the ones not from word parts. Uh, so looking here, all different combos of pieces of words that we have seen before, a lot of them have to do with the bones and putting on a ending for the word that means pertaining to. So if we remember AL as a suffix, like in carpal means pertaining to, in this case the carpals. Um, what else? IC, which, oh, here we go. And ischiopubic means pertaining to. 
AR means pertaining to, in this case, the clavicle. Uh, and there's more. So uh, uh, most of these are pertaining to whatever bone or area that we're talking about. Other ones have to do with movement. For example, bradykinesia. Brady is another one that we um, kind of missed in translation. Brady is a prefix that means slow. We'll see that again when we talk about heartbeat. But bradykinesia would be slow movement. Hyperkinesia means too much movement or excessive movement. Um, let's see. Otherwise, I think most of the other ones are pretty self-explanatory. Um, here's the rest of the list. Again, you see a lot of pertaining to's in here. Um, whether it's pertaining to two areas, in this case, the sternum and the clavicle. Go in order of the definition or word part. Um, you could technically flip-flop these and have it be equally correct. Clavicula sternor um, would work. It just sounds bad. Um, or if you're going above or under certain areas, like submandibular would be pertaining to under the mandible, under your chin. Um, or suprascapular would mean above the scapula. Um, so take some time and work through. The exercises are long but very helpful. Um, exercise 35 is going to be a great one for you to kind of get you oriented. There are going to be complementary terms, not from word part. To review, dystrophy, if we remember what dys means as a prefix, you should know that it means painful or difficult um, or abnormal, as it does in this case. Uh, trophy means development, so A is the correct answer. Okay, these are the ones that are not built from word parts. Uh, in this case, on this chapter, it's mostly the specialists and the specialty. So chiropractics or chiropractic is the system of treatment that is kind of specializing in the vertebral column. And a person who studies that is a chiropractor. Uh, and that's abbreviated DC because it's a doctor of chiropractics. Later on in the list, we have orthopedics and orthopedist. Um, the orthopedics is the area of specialty called ortho. Um, that does the diseases and abnormalities of the musculoskeletal system. So the chiropractor really focuses on the vertebral column. They're kind of like a specialist, um, whereas the orthopedist deals with abnormalities of the muscular skeletal system and they treat diseases of those systems. Um, there is an osteopath who studies osteopathy um, which is really the emphasis on uh, the relation between body organs and the muscular skeletal system. So that's more of like the, the organ piece it's kind of hard. I would say that orthopedics is more of like the, the bones itself. Osteopathy would be more of um, body organs and how it relates to the muscular skeletal system. Which brings us to rheumatologists and rheumatology. Um, rheumatology is the study of rheumatic diseases, um, but this really focused on that inflammation piece, um, which is where the rheumatoid comes from. Uh, in your book, there's a little blurb about the difference between rheumatology and orthopedics on page 575 that you can kind of read through to get a better distinction. Um, other terms in here, we have crepitus. Um, that's this word right here. Um, that's a crackling sound um, when two bones rub against each other. So... Um, it's also heard in, in pneumonia whenever a doctor puts that stethoscope on your front or back and says breathe in and out deeply. They're listening for that crackling sound, um, but it's an indication of bones rubbing together so that that could be a muscular skeletal problem. Um, oh, I skipped a area and specialty, orthotics and orthotist. Orthotics has to do with your... Um, 
orthopedic devices. So that I always think of um, foot pads or arch supports. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be for your feet. That's just one easy thing. But orthotics are all of the um, supportment, alignment, prevention, correction tools. And an orthotist is a person who specialized in that. So maybe they um, design insoles for your collapsed arches or give you a brace for your bunion or other things. That would be what they do. Um, osteoclast. Um, it's kind of weirdly in here with all the other words, but that's the one that is a bone cell that um, helps maintain healthy bone tissue. It's the one that is uh, absorbing minerals. It works with osteoblasts, which aren't in this list. Um, podiatrist studies podiatry, which isn't in the list either. Um, they're the ones that deal specially with feet. Um, so, for example, if you have a bunion, you would go to the podiatrist, and then they would refer you to the orthotist to get a special brace. It's a mouthful, but makes sense. Prosthesis are any kind of artificial items, whether it is a full leg, an eye, a hip replacement, any artificial substitute. Whew. All right. So there's a lot of different specialties. They kind of sound similar, especially osteopathy and orthopedics. Um, please go through and try to do the matching in exercise 38 to really get an idea of what goes where. Okay, so if you were to get a total knee replacement, what would that be considered? It is considered a prosthesis or a prosthetic. A lot of people think that you need like a hand or an arm, but even on the inside, replacement parts like this are also considered prosthetic. Which specialist would see these? Um, so this is a medical management for chronic hip pain. So this person has osteoarthritis in the hip. You can see here that would be a rheumatologist because it has to do with um, management of this chronic condition. Um, there would be a lot of inflammation here. Surgical treatment for the hip, which now re, you, know, you would basically get the top of your femur cut off and put a whole new resurface on. That's when you would actually go to see the orthopedist for, or the specialty of orthopedics. So this branch here is really surgical intervention. They're the ones that are doing the surgeries. The rheumatologist and rheumatology are really the management, the chronic support, the medication, the ongoing counseling, that kind of thing. Okay, um, here's just a table put together to kind of help you navigate that. So if you're wanting to, again, focus on these different things, freeze the screen, read through. Lastly, at the end of this chapter, I'm not sure why they don't put it in chapter three with all the other body directional terms, um, but we have types of movement. So um, depending on how you're moving your limbs, it's got a different phrase. So, for example, if you are taking your legs and you bend up. So you kind of bend your leg up, touch your calf to your um, hamstrings here. Um, that would be flex flexion. If you are sticking it straight out or extending it all the way, that would be extension. Um, Pronation is when you have the top of your hand facing outward. It's the opposite of anatomical positioning. Uh, supination is when you are in that anatomical position. And if we remember, um, supine can be on the back there. Um, so facing up, that's what this is. Uh, there's abduction and adduction. 
Um, ab is when you move the limb away from your body. Adduction is when you're bringing it back. I always remember that adduction means kind of like you're adding it back to your body so it comes back towards the midframe. Um, eversion and inversion. Eversion is when it kind of tilts or rotates away from the midline of the body, whereas inversion you can see is going towards the big toe that's going towards the inside or middle of the body. And then finally, rotation. You can get that one just kind of turning your head a little bit. Okay, this brings us to the end where we have all of our abbreviations throughout the whole chapter. Um, I do want to point out that, again, the different vertebrae are not just CV, TV, LV, but they do have actual numbering associated with them. So the cervical um, over here is thoracic and down here is lumbar. Um, we have the different specialties. So we have the doctor of chiropractics, doctor of orthopedics, and so on, um, and a few other different disorders along the way. Um, these were pointed out throughout, but they are all listed in a table in the back. I would suggest trying exercise 44 to kind of get a good read through of what those are. All right, what is the abbreviation for this chronic systemic disease? Keywords being autoimmune inflammatory. Rheumatoid arthritis is the condition, so the abbreviation for that would be RA. All right, here we have um, a forearm injury, broken bone. It looks like the ulna has snapped at the wrist. This is a fracture in general terms. Um, so we would abbreviate it FX. It looks like a Collie's fracture um, based on where it is. Um, okay. This is an example of a crazy amount of abbreviations. We have not learned all of these yet, so as you're looking at this, don't. it's okay to say, oh my God. Um, but this is what doctors and nurses use on a daily basis. If you had to write out all of these words, it would take forever. So um, some of these we might have seen, um, but we're going to learn a little bit more of them as we move through the book. So just be thinking about how there is importance in these abbreviations. Here's what that looks like if you translate it. So I will leave this up for a moment, but you can, you know, go back and forth from the two and see if you can pick out what the abbreviation translates to in full words. And that brings us to the end of chapter 14.